Well, good morning. Uh, welcome to the worship of our God here at Gospel Fellowship Presbyterian Church. I'm Pastor David, the associate pastor uh, here. Our senior pastor, Pastor Matt, is away on vacation, so we'll be praying for him and his family. Uh, we have the privilege today of having uh, Sean Spaltai preach for us uh, this morning. Uh, I'll be preaching from uh, an excellent text in Isaiah 12. Uh, so uh, be uh, praying for him as we uh, prepare uh, this morning. Uh, if you're visiting with us, we're really glad you're here. I hope you make use of the yellow visitor's cards in front of you in the pew. Uh, helps us to uh, keep in touch with you as well as to pray for you. Uh, just a few announcements, things you can find in the bulletin. We have uh, a few camps that uh, our youth can sign up for. Uh, snow camp for the youth and then also a young adults uh, camp uh, that you can find as well. Uh, we do have a congregational meeting coming up this month. encourage you to look again at the schedule for that uh, as, as well as uh, in today's service. Uh, we'll be celebrating the Lord's Supper. So be in preparation uh, that we might be those who come in faith discerning the body of Christ. Uh, but let's uh, prepare our hearts now for worship as we listen to the prelude. Worship God, who delivers you from all your enemies. We will sing of his strength, for he is our fortress. Come worship God, who saves you. We will sing aloud of his steadfast love in the morning. Amen. Let's stand together and sing hymn 243, Praise the Savior Now and Ever.
Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Lord God, our Heavenly Father, as we come to worship you this morning, we thank you for delivering us from our enemies. We thank you for saving us, as there is nothing we could do to save ourselves. For we were once dead in our trespasses and sins, until our eyes were opened and we could see and understand how our sin displeased you, and that we are deserving of your wrath and judgment on that day. We have all sinned and fallen short. We continually sin and do not keep your commandments. Lord, we humbly kneel before your throne this morning to confess and repent of our sins. How great is your love for us that you sent your only son, that he should become sin in our place and that he is our righteousness and that if we believe in him, he will forever set us free from bondage to sin and we would be saved from our sins. Thank you for your faithfulness to us, your compassion and love, grace and mercy. And as we begin this new year, let, us, let our resolution be to please you each day. Please fill us with your spirit so that we may increase in holiness and righteousness that is pleasing to you. And we ask this all in the name of our precious Savior. Amen. Let us now confess our faith together using the Westminster Confession of Faith 26.2 that is in your bulletin. Saints by profession are bound to maintain a holy fellowship and communion in the worship of God and in performing such other spiritual services as tend to their mutual edification, as also in relieving each other in outward things according to their several abilities and necessities, which communion, as God offereth opportunity, is to be extended unto all those who, in every place, call upon the name of the Lord Jesus. Please be seated. The scripture for our tithes and offerings this morning is Malachi chapter 3, verse 10. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. We will not uh, be physically collecting the offering this morning, so please use the offering plate in the narthex after the service, or you may uh, mail your gift to the office or Give online.
please stand for the doxology. God, we thank you for all things, as we know they all come from you. Every beast of the forest is yours. All that moves is yours. The world in its fullness is yours. As we give back a portion to you, we ask your blessing upon it. Bless its use in your service for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. And... Let's continue our worship this morning with hymn 393, Come Let Us Join with One Accord. Let us join together now in seeking uh, the face of our God in prayer. Heavenly Father, you are the only true God, the God of heaven and earth, the creator and sustainer of all things. And not only this, you are our God who has made us your people. And Heavenly Father, as we have already confessed our sins and come before you, uh, to admit our frailty and our need of you, we also come before you now in obedience to you and to your command that we cast our cares on you. So, Heavenly Father, we ask as you, that you would hear us as we uh, pray for the concerns that are on our hearts and on our minds this day, uh, perhaps even distracting us from being fully engaged here at uh, your worship. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would be with all those who uh, for any reason, are unable to be with us today. We miss them, Heavenly Father. We ask that you would be with them. Uh, even in the absence of our presence with them, we ask that you would be with them, encouraging them, those who are sick or who are unable to be here because of uh, fear or concern of getting sick uh, or because of weakness. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would be with them. We ask that you would be with us as we are here. We ask that you would sustain our worship and our fellowship, that you would keep us healthy as there is a sickness going through our land. We ask that you would continue to be merciful and gracious to us, that we could continue to worship you together freely here. Heavenly Father, there's a lot going on in our land also politically. Heavenly Father, we 
uh, acknowledge the sin of our nation in supporting abortion for so long. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would forgive us. We ask that you would turn hearts to you. We ask that you would bring an end to that sin in our nation, that it would be put away from our midst, not just by legal action, but by the change of people's hearts, that they would see it as wrong, that they would glorify you and therefore uh, be unable to continue allowing it. We ask that you would uh, give us a revival in our nation, that your word would be heard and believed every, everywhere, that there would be a revival and a, a regrowth into your name uh, in our nation, that we would all be blessed by it. And Heavenly Father, we ask that you would use us to bring it about. We ask that you would give us uh, the power by your Spirit to live lives that say that we are different before our friends and our neighbors, that we would have the words to speak to them, uh, to explain why we have a hope in you, and we ask that through uh, your work in us and the way that you grow us and cause us to live, that you would then apply your work to their lives, that they would believe and become your people too. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would be with our magistrates, that they would uh, have their hearts turned to you. And Heavenly Father, those whose hearts won't turn to you, we ask that you would use them anyways for your glory, that in spite of themselves, they would uh, rule justly, especially Heavenly Father, so that as you command uh, we might be able to live peaceably uh, with all men, that we would be able to freely assemble to worship you, and that ultimately through all of these things you would be glorified. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would be with us as we come to your word, as we consider it, and as we seek to love and obey you through it. We ask that you would use it for your intended purpose. Now, Heavenly Father, we pray in the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please stand now, and we will read uh, from God's holy and inerrant and authoritative word. Uh, we'll be reading from Isaiah chapter 12. Uh, that's printed in your bulletins, if you do not have your Bibles here. Isaiah chapter 12. You will say in that day, I will give thanks to you, O Lord. For though you were angry with me, your anger turned away, that you might comfort me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust, and I will not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation, and you will say in that day, Give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, Make known his deeds among the peoples. Proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing praises to the Lord, for he has done gloriously. Let this be made known in all the earth. Shout and sing for joy, O inhabitant of Zion, for great in your midst is the Holy One of Israel. May God add his blessing to our reading and the hearing of his word. Please be seated. Throughout the history of the world, God's people have often responded uh, to dire and difficult circumstances in ways that many people would consider very, very strange. Uh, many of you may know the story of Horatio Spafford, uh, and even if you don't know him by name, you'll probably recognize this as we go along. Uh, he was a man who lived over 100 years ago, uh, and he had his four-year-old son die. Then he lost all of his investments in the Chicago fire. And as he was planning a trip with his family uh, to England, uh, things came up that he needed to stay behind. And so he sent his wife and his four daughters ahead of him. And his, the ship that, they, that his wife and daughters were on uh, sank at sea. And he received a famous now telegram uh, that said from his wife, saved alone. And he lost his four daughters there as well. Then as he went, to rejoin his wife in England, uh, as the ship drew near the place where his four daughters had died, uh, he composed 
the song, It Is Well With My Soul. Rather than being completely destroyed, even as his life here was uh, disrupted beyond what many of us will ever know in this life, uh, he expressed trust and hope in the Lord. And this wasn't just a one-off uh, experience. Uh, Adam, after being judged, uh, named his wife, who is going to be the mother of people who die, the mother of all living. Uh, many of the Psalms start with mourning over sickness, over depression, over men hating, uh, but end with praising God. Uh, King David himself, when his son was dying, he prayed and was sorrowful until his son died, and then he got up and was acting normal again. Paul and Silas, unjustly imprisoned, were singing praises to God. <clears throat> This past year has given pretty much all of us at least one or many reasons uh, to be sorrowful, to feel badly, um, to uh, be discouraged. Uh, and so this passage, uh, Pastor Matt encouraged me to uh, switch to, and I had initially declined, but it's so timely for us. This passage calls on us to recognize that there is joy in the individual experience and the communal expression of God's love, regardless of what our circumstances are. So first we're going to look at uh, the individual experience of salvation in verses 1 to 2. Uh, and then we're going to look in verses 3 to 6 at the joy that we can have in the communal expression, the expression together of our salvation. And just like with Pastor David's passage last week, where there was an important central verse uh, this one also has an important central verse. Verse 3 is going to be the center of our passage. The first couple verses pour toward it. The last few verses come out of it. So when we get there, we're going to spend a little bit of extra time on it. So first of all, this passage says, uh, You will say in that day, I will give thanks to you, O Lord. And so here, uh, this you in the first verse, it's very important. This is a singular you. Uh, this isn't a you all together will be doing this. This is a you individually, each of you must be doing this. There's no one else who can do what is in these couple of verses for you. Uh, and first of all, that is giving thanks to God. Now, why are we giving thanks to God? First of all, because it says, though you were angry with me, your anger turned away. God justly had wrath for us when we were apart from Christ. Uh, just like the Israelites who at this time were fearing the wrath of God coming from the Assyrians, we all, apart from Christ, deserved God's wrath against sin, his separation from us, his judgment of us, and the impending doom coming to us. And Christianity never, ever calls for us to deny reality. Okay, it's not looking at something with faith as in, denying uh, what we know in reason, as some might say, but it is embracing what is true, uh, regardless of how hard that is. And thank, frankly, God's wrath is not something we really want to dwell on very long. It is a scary and terrible thing. Uh, but this wrath that he had for us, he turned aside. Now, the Israelites, um, reading these passages of Isaiah, would see the wrath turned aside in the relenting of the Assyrian army, God turning his wrath from them onto the Assyrians and pouring it out on them, thus freeing the Israelites. But we, from our perspective, after Christ, now have an even greater reason for rejoicing in God's wrath being turned aside because it's not just temporal judgment or temporary trouble that's been turned aside from us, but he has turned aside from placing the wrath of sin on us to place it on his own son. His son, who was the creator of the universe, for whom and through whom everything was made, he took the judgment that we deserved on the cross. Jesus Christ, who never deserved any judgment of God, took the full measure of it for his people. And so God's wrath was turned away from us. How great a reason to rejoice is that, that we do not have to face God's wrath. And this passage just doesn't stop there and say, his wrath is turned away, wonderful, happy day, the end. But his wrath turned away, it says, that you might comfort me. Okay, so this is our song that God turned his wrath away for the purpose of comforting us. Now, parents, you may have had a child who rightly 
incurred your wrath. They disobeyed, and there was justice due for that. Um, but you may have also had them do it at a, in a time, in a way, that they needed comfort. Perhaps they reached out and they grabbed a hot stove or put their hand in a fire when you had told them not to. Or perhaps they had reached up onto the table and pulled something down and made a mess, but also hurt themselves in what they were doing. Now, it is possible that you could discipline them for their disobedience, uh, but what they need there uh, is not necessarily more discipline than they've already received, but what they need is comfort. And so in the same way, God selflessly, with the purpose of comforting, put away his wrath. How comforted would a child who had just burned themselves be if you yelled at them that they should be okay? Not very. But God here shows his great love for us that he puts his wrath away, not because of anything we have done to earn it, not because of anything we have earned, uh, not because we don't deserve his wrath, but just in order so that he could comfort us. Some people see a, a contrast between the God of justice in the Old Testament and the God of love in the New Testament and say there must be some kind of conflict where one wins over the other and so God can show us mercy. But that's not how it is at all. God's entire plan was for our good, that he could show us love and that he could bring comf comfort to us. This is true love, not that he gains anything from us, but that he purely expresses love for us. And so in our salvation, God is doing all of this work, the turning aside of wrath, the comforting us, bringing us in, giving us so many benefits, peace of conscience, knowledge of his love, fellowship with him and with each other in the Holy Spirit. He has so many things that he's given to us. But then in verse 2, we see what we contribute, how we work for our salvation. And that is to say, we don't work at all. Look at verse 2 here. Uh, it begins and ends uh, first and last phrase here, Behold, God is my salvation. And then at the end, And he has become my salvation. Everything about this second verse and what we're going to be doing is surrounded by the fact that God himself is our salvation, that he has done everything for us in verse 1. So what are we doing at all then? Second part of verse 2 says, I will trust and I will not be afraid. That's it. We trust in God. That is all he has called us to do, not to accomplish any great works, not to do anything wonderful, not to go and give all that we have, but simply to be saved, to be part of his family. We just have to trust in him. We have to repent of our sins, turn to him, and trust that he will take care of us. And this trust and lack of fear is expressed beautifully uh, by the Apostle John in 1 John chapter 4. If you want to turn there, uh, 1 John chapter 4, and we'll just look at verses 16 to 19 uh, briefly. Here he is talking about the love of God and how that casts out fear. First John chapter 4, verses 16 to 19 say, So we have come to know and to believe that love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment, because he is also, because as he is, excuse me, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. And so this trust and this lack of fear isn't something we work up in ourselves. This trust is something that he gives to us uh, because of his goodness, because of his greatness. Uh, and then this love that he has for us is what drives out fear. Uh, the Bible expresses this in so many different ways. It says, if God is for me, who can be against me? If the God who created the universe has declared me to be his child, how much can anyone in this earth do against me? This is a wonderful encouragement, brothers and sisters, that no matter what is going on, the steadfast love of God cannot be frustrated by anything that comes into our life. And we're even encouraged that everything that does come into our life has been brought there by God, not just to try us or test us or to knock us down, but for our own good, because we've been called according to his purposes. 
So even as we experience our salvation working out, and Jesus tells us that we will have trouble in this world, he says, don't be afraid, I've overcome the world. And so we rest, even in hard times, in the favor and in the love of God, that it will never pass away and that it can never pass away. Verse 2 continues and says, For the Lord God is my strength and my song. Uh, Now, if you look very closely at your text, you'll notice that Lord and God are both capitalized. This is very, very, very rare in the scriptures. Usually, one word for God will be capitalized, and that's representing the divine name, Yahweh or Jehovah, uh, is being used there. And then the other would be the Jewish word, the Hebrew word for either the Lord or God. So Lord, capital God, would be Adonai, Yahweh, uh, God is the Lord, uh, or capital Lord, Yahweh, God, Yahweh Elohim would be saying the Lord is God, but here it is Yah Yahweh. It is emphatically saying that the covenant God of Israel is the one here who is accomplishing this. There is no one else and none beside him. I believe it's used one other time in the scriptures, uh, this emphatic Yah Yahweh, just repeating God's divine name. And so absolutely only solely this God, no mixing of anything else, this God and him alone, this is saying, is my strength and my song. So God is our strength, first of all. Uh, As any of you who are over the age of about two will know, uh, our strength fails sometimes. We get sick, we get hurt, We come under temptation that we feel we can't bear and we give in, and we fail. We do not have the strength that we need to live our lives on our own. The only place we have strength from is from the Lord. And even those gifts that we have, our highest and strongest and mightiest things that we're most proud of, our skills that we've developed, our natural and innate talents that we've been given, we can't actually take credit for. The God who made us has given them to us. And so he is our strength. He is the source of everything that is good in us. And this is a reason uh, not for sadness, but for praise. Because he has given them to us. They are gifts from him. Every good thing in our lives is a direct gift from the Father of lights, from our God who loves us and from him alone. And so we praise him for it. He also, though, has become our song. If he is our strength, he is also our song, our reason for rejoicing. Uh, There is nothing else that we should be lauding as high as God or be thinking is as wonderful as God. We may be very happy with our spouse that God has given us, but it's our spouse that God has given us, and so he should receive the thanks and the glory for it. We may be thankful for a church where we are able to freely assemble and worship our God together. And we should be thankful to God that he has provided it for us. We may be thankful for our gifts and our talents, but again, these are from the Lord. And so not only is he what we praise in our songs, but he is the, also the source of our songs. He is the reason that we are singing in the first place. So as we consider these individual verses, have you experienced this? Are you leaning on Christ alone for your salvation? Or are you leaning on yourself? Is there something that you think you have done to please God and that that is the reason that he loves you? If that is where you are, in trusting in something other than Christ, repent and turn to him because nothing in these next verses is for you apart from Christ. But... If you are trusting in Christ, if he is your Savior, if the Lord, the Lord, Yahweh, Yahweh, is your God and your only God, rejoice. There is no better source of hope and joy in this life or in the one to come than him. Trouble will come, but he is with us through everything. He is the Lord of everything. But now for all those who have had this individual experience of being saved by the Lord, uh, we come to... Uh, the communal expression of salvation. Verse 3 starts out, With joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. This well of salvation is none other 
than Jesus himself. He is the well, the source, the fount of our salvation. As he talked to the Samaritan woman at the well, and he asked her for water, he later told her that if she knew who he was, she would have asked him for water, and he would have given to her, and she would never be thirsty again. Not because he would give her something uh, magical that would never make her physically thirst again, but because if she came to him in faith, she would have, as Jesus said, living waters flowing from her heart. He would be with her and providing for her through her whole life. And so this well is Christ. This is the well that we come to together. And now the, that point that we come together is very important. I pointed out in verse 1 that it was individual you, each of you. But the use here in verse 3 and verse 4, with joy you will draw water, and in verse 4, and you will say in that day, are not individual. This is you all. Uh, if the translators of the ESV had been from Pittsburgh, they might have said, and yins, okay? This is a plural you, all of you together are to be doing these things. And that's not something we as Americans uh, do very well, doing religion together. We come together on Sunday morning, and we exhort each other, we sing to each other, we worship God together, and sometimes we get together once, twice maybe in a week with other Christians, uh, but other than that, our, our religion and our worship of God is very tight to the chest. We don't pry into how other people's relationships are going with God. We don't uh, speak into other people's lives as we might. We instead just practice our own thing and we worship together on Sunday. But that is not how God has called us to be. He has called us uh, individually to be saved, but then to come together as a body to be built up and to draw from the wells of salvation. And so the rest of this passage is going to be calling us not to individually do something, but to be doing something to and with and for each other. And so we need to be getting into each other's lives. Uh, as these th other things come up, you need to be thinking, are there people I should be addressing with these questions? Uh, and knowing how private a lot of us are with our religion, people might be assuming that we are not people they should be coming to with these questions and exhortations. So we might need to invite people. Hey, I'm a Christian. You're a Christian. I need you to be in my life asking me these questions, seeing how things are going and exhorting me to follow after God the way he commanded. And so as we read through the rest of this passage, be thinking about this as something to do together with others, to invite them into your lives and to ask them if you can be part of theirs. There's also a conjunction in verse 3 that's not translated into the English. It's just a simple little and that starts out the verse, and with joy you will draw water from the wells of salvation. And this is a very, very small thing, one letter in the Hebrew uh, that often is omitted in narratives because it's just part of how they progress things and say that the story is continuing. And this goes on and this goes on. If you read the King James or some other translations, almost every verse in Genesis starts with and. Um, but here it's very important because it's telling us that this communal drawing water, this communal together going to the Savior is based entirely on individuals already having experienced uh, the salvation in Christ alone. Uh, so this drawing water from the well together flows from having gone to Christ individually. And then one last thing to address here in verse 3 is, who is you? And yes, for English teachers, I did mean who is you, not who are you. Who is the you that this is talking about? With joy, you will draw water. You all, who is all of you? Now, Isaiah was initially writing this and speaking for people in ancient Israel. Uh, but it's speaking about in that day, in the day when, as we learned about last week, the shoot from the stump of Jesse has come. Salvation is available to everyone. And so this you is all believers together. Uh, not just certain sects, not just certain denominations, not just certain people, but all believers together. All the redeemed of the Lord. The reunification and the bringing together of God's people 
is one of the major themes of Isaiah as you go through it. And so here it is again. This you is not just a specific group of people or a subset of God's people, but all of the redeemed are called to be doing this. And that means it directly applies to us. We don't have to talk about how does this apply to ancient Israel? How does it apply to us now? You are, if you've trusted in Christ, God's redeemed. And so this is for you. And so we're going to see now that in verses 4 through 6, there is joy in and joy from exhorting one another. This is for you, Christians, together. So first of all, let's look briefly at the reasons for joy and for exhorting each other. And that in these passages is frankly just God's greatness. Uh, In verse 4, it says his name is exalted. Verse 5, he has done gloriously. In verse 6, he is great in your midst. So first of all, his name is exalted. He, in himself, is the great and high God. He is truly holy. He is the holy, holy, holy God. He is the creator of everything, and so he deserves all praise and glory. He is marvelous in himself. Also, he has done gloriously. Uh, You can think about how the Canaanites, when the Israelites were afraid of their size, the Canaanites were terrified because God had conquered the gods of the Egyptians and done mighty things there. He has done glorious things in creating the world in six days and in accomplishing our salvation in Christ. So he is great. He has done great things. And then in verse 6, he is great in our midst. Think about all of the wonderful things that you have seen or heard of God doing. He has established this church. In many ways, uh, it was acts of God that brought this church together and caused it to exist in the first place. He has provided for it in its ministries in wonderful ways. Uh, Last summer during CRP, I can testify to God's greatness. If it had rained with the COVID restrictions, we would have been in a lot of trouble. It didn't rain for weeks on end, from 9 o'clock to noon, the wettest time of the day generally. It did not rain. God was fantastic here to his people. And so we all have these stories. We can point to how God is objectively great. We can point to the great things he's done in the past. And we can point to how he's been great, not just back then or with those people, but here in our midst, we can point to how he has taken care of us as a community, but also in our lives. Look back over your life and consider all of the times that God provided for you, giving you what you needed at the right time, a friend, a spouse, children, uh, taking care of your needs, causing you to get better uh, when you were sick, sustaining your life perhaps through accidents that could have taken it. God has been great among us. And so these are all given to us as reasons for joy and for exhorting one another. And then it gives us also the content, the content of our exhortations and our encouragements to one another. Uh, Verses 4, 5, and 6 all give us one central, central thing to be encouraging one one another to do, and that's to thank God. It says, thank God, praise him, shout, and sing for joy. All of these things that God has done should drive your heart to express joy. But the command here isn't for you individually to express joy, but it is to be saying to the others, Praise God. It's to remind them and call on them to praise God. This isn't a question of, are you doing it? It is, are you going to your brothers and sisters in the Lord and encouraging them to praise God, reminding him, them of his greatness, of his care? Another exhortation we're to be giving here is to call on him. Okay? We have troubles. We have struggles. Some of us, more than others, like to complain about the hard things in our lives. And sometimes when we hear of somebody else's struggles, we just say, yeah, or I'll pray for you. But here, our encouragement shouldn't just be, I'll pray for you, but are you seeking God? Talk to him about this. I will seek God for you also because I love you. But God loves you more than I do. Go to him too and be encouraged by these things that he has already been doing for you. And then lastly here, we are to call on each other to make God's name known. We're to tell others, to tell others about what God has done. And the word here used is uh, among all the peoples and in all the earth. Now, sometimes it's the uh, Hebrew Bible says the nations. That means 
The people who are far away from God, those other guys, tell them. And sometimes it says, the people, singular, uh, my people, God telling you to tell others to tell just Christians to believe in him and to trust. But here his name, is, his deeds are to be known among all peoples, plural. That is, no exceptions, no one's not supposed to hear about God, but everyone is supposed to hear. So this is a call to be living lives of love before our neighbors and, ex- and exalting God before them. But it's also a call for us to encourage each other to share our love of God with God's people themselves. Okay, it's not just an evangelistic imperative, but speaking with each other. How many of your friends know what God has done for you in your life? How many of your kids know the stories of all the great things God has done in your life? His name is great from other things, but have you shared his goodness to you with them, and have you encouraged them to also share that? This is what we are called to then. Uh, Because of God's greatness, because of his good deeds, because of what he has done in and for us, we are to be encouraging each other to be thanking him, to be seeking his face, and to be making his deeds known. Now, most of us struggle with joy at some point or another. Uh, As with everything else, frankly, we are frail people and liable to failure. Uh, And whether joy is an occasional struggle for you or whether it's a regular one, uh, we can all be encouraged this is a common struggle for many of God's people. Some of the greatest men in history have been men who struggled with joy. Uh, King David himself often struggled uh, with depression. Uh, Martin Luther, Spurgeon, and many others are men used of God, godly men who still struggled with joy. So if you're someone who struggles with having joy, uh, don't let your struggle with joy be another reason to struggle with joy. Okay? But come back to these things. Come back to the greatness of God, how he worked salvation in your life, how he has taken care of everything for you, how he has given you a perfect Savior, and how he has worked both in past, in the Bible, in the scriptures, in your uh, family and those who led you to Christ, but also in your own life. And rejoice in these things. Uh, Because we cannot uh, accomplish our salvation. We cannot work ourselves up to joy. uh, But we can have them through our Savior who has purchased even this benefit for us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are uh, the great God who has created us, the God who has uh, given us all that we need or could hope for or ask for. Heavenly Father, as we look back at this year, uh, it's been a tough one. Uh, For so many, there's been pain and sorrow and sickness, if not uh, directly, then from others' responses uh, and from even strife, disagreeing over how to respond to things. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you've been with us through it all. We ask that you would forgive us for ways that we have uh, refused to rejoice in you, whether it's been refusing to rest in our Savior and come to you individually, or whether it's been refusing to... uh, call on others to love you. We ask that you would uh, forgive us. We ask that you would grow us uh, in this grace of loving one another and of coming to you in joy uh, by your Holy Spirit. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Let us turn now to hymn number 281. And we will sing the first two verses of I Know That My Redeemer Lives as we prepare for the Lord's Supper.